Chapter 2. Amphetamine. A few key facts. What is it? A synthesised powder or pill? A stimulant. Popular in Southeast Asia and Australasia in particular. Consumed by swallowing, snorting, smoking or injecting. Time scale varies with consumption method, usually four to eight hours. Some effects include increased confidence, alertness, heart rate, blood pressure and body temperature. Whether you've seen Breaking Bad or you've read about speed freaks in beat poetry from the 1950s, amphetamine has a rich cultural history. And the substance also has a long medical history. Amphetamine was first synthesised in the late 1800s, but it wasn't patented or investigated as a medication until the 1930s. It was synthesised as an attempt to improve on a substance called ephedrine, which was used at the time as a treatment for asthma. Ephedrine had a number of side effects, including trouble sleeping, anxiety, hallucinations, even risk of stroke or heart attack. It was also prone to abuse. Amphetamine was chemically similar to ephedrine, and the hope was that it would not have these side effects. While amphetamine wasn't a brilliant treatment for asthma, inhalers containing it were marketed as benzedrine, both for asthma and as a nasal decongestant. Even now, ephedrine and pseudoephedrine remain in some over-the-counter nasal decongestant sprays. Amphetamine's stimulant properties were also noticed during research on the compound, and during the Second World War, Amphetamine pills were used by British and American troops, while German and Japanese forces were taking the chemically similar analogue methamphetamine. Amphetamine as a medication to treat depression fell somewhat out of favour when other, less dependence-forming medications were developed, but it is still prescribed to this day, now as a treatment for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD. The medication branded as Adderall contains deamphetamine and a small amount of levoamphetamine. Amphetamine has been popular as a diet pill, as a means to stay awake or alert, and as a study aid. While we might think of the use of chemical cognitive enhancers as something modern, the first media reports of students misusing amphetamine to help them study came way back in 1937, the same year it was first marketed. Amphetamine is particularly popular in Asia, Australasia and North America. And overall, it has historically been the second most widely used illicit drug worldwide, after cannabis. I say historically, as the World Drug Report from the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, published in 2018, found that opioid use is now equal to amphetamine use worldwide, with an estimated 34 million individuals using either substance at least once in 2016. What is it? The term amphetamine is often used as a catch-all for substances including amphetamine sulfate and methamphetamine. These are chemically very similar, although methamphetamine absorbs more easily into fats, a quality known as lipophilia. Amphetamine sulfate is a stimulant. It's sometimes known as speed or whiz, but you might also have heard of the brand names benzedrine or Adderall. Although, see later in the chapter, the term speed might actually refer to methamphetamine these days. It certainly does in Australia. It can be a white or off-white or pinkish crystal powder. It can be in pill form or it is sometimes found as a putty-like substance. It can also be found in a freebase form, similar to the differences between cocaine and crack cocaine, which is an oily liquid. Methamphetamine is chemically similar to amphetamine but is more potent and can cross the blood-brain barrier more quickly. Methamphetamine is often called meth, crystal meth or ice. Meth is a white, bitter-tasting powder. Crystal meth has large, clear, chunky crystals that look a bit like ice, hence the name. In Southeast Asia and Australasia, the most predominant form of amphetamine used is crystalline methamphetamine. I'll go into more detail about this at the end of the chapter. Methamphetamine must be metabolised into amphetamine in the body before it can be excreted, which is one explanation for why intoxication on methamphetamine lasts for longer than amphetamine sulphate. I will use the term amphetamine throughout the rest of this chapter to refer to amphetamine or methamphetamine, since most of the contents of this chapter apply to both. And unless I'm specifically talking about amphetamine sulphate, methamphetamine or crystal meth, in which case I will use those terms. Amphetamine can be consumed in a number of ways. It can be swallowed, snorted, injected, and crystal meth can also be smoked in the same way as crack cocaine or heroin. 
heated until it turns into vapour and then inhaled, rather than smoking per se. What are the short-term effects? When amphetamine was initially investigated in the early 1930s, subjects reported increased feelings of well-being, confidence, alertness and energy. Amphetamine is a stimulant, so it has the classic stimulant effects of increasing heart rate and blood pressure and of decreasing appetite. How quickly a person begins to feel the effects of amphetamine will depend on the method of administration. If amphetamine is swallowed, it has to be absorbed through the stomach and can take around half an hour to kick in. If snorted, intoxication will occur within minutes and if smoked or injected, it will be almost instantaneous. Duration of intoxication is similarly variable, but it can last in the region of four to eight hours. Amphetamine intoxication can induce feelings of confidence, well-being, alertness, motivation and focus. If snorted or injected, onset of intoxication can feel like a rush of euphoria. People on amphetamine can appear more chatty and social, and they might also have an increased sex drive. The combination of reducing tiredness and increasing energy has led some people to use amphetamine as a performance enhancer. There are reports of use among long-distance drivers, although the evidence is less than convincing, about whether performance at tasks such as driving is actually improved, or the increased confidence caused by intoxication might lead a user to believe erroneously that it has improved. Amphetamine will increase a person's heart rate, blood pressure and body temperature, as all stimulants do. A person will experience a dry mouth and a lower appetite and their pupils will dilate. Many people report negative feelings as well as or instead of the positive ones described above. Amphetamine can increase anxiety and irritability, as well as causing restlessness and paranoia. There are many documented cases of amphetamine-induced psychosis, which can last days or weeks after taking the drug. Some surveys suggest that these can occur in around 15-23% to of amphetamine users, and these symptoms can also be induced in experimental studies. In almost all cases, the psychotic states will end after a person stops using amphetamine, although there is evidence that about one in five individuals who experience severe amphetamine-induced psychosis will go on to develop a prolonged psychotic disorder, potentially even schizophrenia. If a person consumes too much amphetamine, they can experience extremely unpleasant symptoms, from difficulty breathing to fits or seizures and extreme agitation. Amphetamine overdose can lead to loss of consciousness and, in extreme circumstances, to stroke, heart attack and death. It can also impact on the body's ability to regulate its own temperature, meaning a person is at risk of hyperthermia, overheating, the opposite of hypothermia. Amphetamine can be dependence-inducing and amphetamine withdrawal can cause tiredness, hunger, irritability and depression, as well as insomnia, mood swings and, as you might expect, craving for amphetamine. The come down after taking amphetamine can last a couple of days for individuals who do not use it regularly or are not dependent on the substance. In these cases, withdrawal can be more severe. What are the longer term effects? As for the risks from longer term regular use of amphetamine over a number of years, this is harder to ascertain because studies are harder to do. Having said that, Given how prevalent amphetamine prescribing was in the 1950s and 1960s, we do know a little about potential long-term risks from regular use, more so than for some other substances. As with all stimulants, a substance that increases heart rate and blood pressure can take its toll on the body, and chronic amphetamine use is linked with an increased risk of heart attack and stroke, particularly in those already at risk. Similarly, amphetamine use has been linked to risk of a regular heartbeat, there's also evidence that long-term use of amphetamine increases the risk of glaucoma, a condition where pressure inside the eye damages the optic nerve. Case reports of amphetamine-induced glaucoma first appeared in medical journals in the 1960s. However, more recently a study found a higher correlation between cocaine use and risk of glaucoma than other illicit drugs, although amphetamine and cannabis use were also associated with an increased risk so this risk is not necessarily specific to amphetamine. There are further risks if a person is injecting amphetamine, including risks from repeated injecting and from poor needle hygiene. Injecting a drug also means that it enters the bloodstream and the brain very quickly, which can increase the potential for dependence to the substance to develop. 
Heavy chronic amphetamine use has been found to be associated with increased levels of anhedonia, one of the symptoms of depression. Anhedonia is broadly defined as an inability to feel pleasure at things you have previously found pleasurable. As mentioned above, it has also been linked to risk of developing psychosis or psychotic disorder, as well as acute amphetamine-induced psychosis during intoxication. Regular amphetamine use is also linked to increased risk of symptoms of anxiety. Brain scan studies have repeatedly found differences in brain structure of populations defined as amphetamine abusers, people who've used amphetamine frequently for a sustained period of time, compared to those who have not used amphetamine. In particular, these differences are seen in grey matter, the volume of which is often reduced compared to healthy controls. Grey matter is located on the surface of the brain, and it's where the synapses, places where brain cells connect to each other, are located. However, it's somewhat tricky to interpret what these differences between groups actually mean. These studies are almost always undertaken in heavy, regular methamphetamine users. It's also extremely difficult to work out whether these differences are due to the use of the drug or whether pre-existing factors predict whether or not an individual is likely to start and carry on using methamphetamine. Perhaps the brain scans are picking up these differences rather than those caused by the drug use. In order to rule these potential alternative explanations out, we would need to take brain scans of individuals before they have ever used a drug and then compare these to their brain after regular methamphetamine use. These studies haven't been conducted yet because it's hard to predict who will go on to become a regular amphetamine user. Potentially, as brain scanning gets cheaper to conduct, studies might be conducted on a large enough scale that this becomes possible but these would need to involve brain scans of many thousands of people. Heavy amphetamine use or amphetamine dependence is associated with poor sleeping, poor nutrition, anorexia and a prematurely aged appearance. Given some of the attributes of amphetamine, this makes some sense. Amphetamine is a stimulant and as such can impact on sleep patterns. Stimulants are also appetite suppressants, which is why amphetamine has been marketed as a diet pill by many companies since it was first developed in the 1930s. As such, people who are trying to reduce their weight might turn to it even now when the risks of using it are better known. The suppression of appetite that amphetamine causes can easily lead to poor nutrition. Not only are people eating less than perhaps they need to, but they may also turn to less healthy foods when they do eat. Myths and misconceptions Speed can sober you up. I've heard people say that speed can sober up a person who has also been drinking alcohol, or that it can even be a way to get around a police breathalyzer if a person is stopped for driving while drunk. There's absolutely no evidence that this is the case. Taking a stimulant while also drunk can mask the effect of both. But feelings can be deceiving. A person in this state certainly won't be able to drive, even if they feel like they might be. It's also easier to overdose on either substance if their intoxication effects are masked by the presence of the other substance. Alcohol and amphetamine have been shown to interact together to increase heart rate and blood pressure beyond that caused by amphetamine alone. As such, the risk of heart attack or stroke is higher if an individual has also consumed alcohol compared to when they've only consumed amphetamine. It's a myth. Speed uses up a chunk of the finite number of beats your heart can do. All stimulants put a strain on your heart, and so using amphetamine regularly will increase a person's risk of cardiovascular problems. But the heart doesn't have a finite number of beats. That means when it's overworked, you'll live shorter. If that was the case, people who spent their lives sitting on the sofa would live longer than those who increase their heart rates with regular exercise. So this is partly true. Amphetamine rots your teeth. There are many case reports that suggest that regular use of amphetamine can increase the risk of poor dental hygiene. There's certainly evidence that regular use of the substance can lead to a dry mouth and teeth grinding is a commonly experienced side effect of intoxication. However, it's harder to say definitively whether it's the drug itself that is doing this or whether other behaviours that the drug causes are leading to tooth damage. For example, it's easy to see how poorer nutrition due to appetite suppression could impact on dental hygiene and the impact amphetamine use has on an individual in terms of their sleep patterns and their general well-being could potentially lead to a person taking less care of oral cleanliness than they should. If the drug is consumed via the mouth, 
for instance by inhaling methamphetamine vapour, then this could also lead directly to tooth damage and might increase the risk of some oral cancers as well. However, there is some evidence that there might be something particularly risky about amphetamine even compared to other drug use. A study conducted in 2008 in Melbourne, Australia, asked around 300 individuals who inject drugs about their substance use and their dental health. They found that amphetamine use was more commonly linked with poor dental health than heroin use, which might indicate that this is not entirely a myth. So it's unclear, but it might be partly true. Does amphetamine have any medical uses? Amphetamine was originally developed by the pharmaceutical industry and has been prescribed as a medication since the 1930s. Some argue that it was the first psychoactive medication available, and it's been used to treat a number of conditions, from mild depression to hypochondria, Parkinson's to narcolepsy, a condition where an individual can fall asleep without warning or ability to prevent it happening. Amphetamine has been marketed as a diet pill and a pep pill, has been used during combat as a method of improving concentration, stamina and morale, and is prescribed today as a treatment for ADHD. When amphetamine became arguably the first marketed antidepressant medication, there was little evidence that it was effective. The man who patented it initially tested it upon himself, an alarmingly common practice, and noted the improvement on his mood. Studies were conducted to test this, and it was found that while amphetamine might relieve mild depression, it had properties that could exacerbate existing anxiety or psychosis-like traits. Later, pharmaceutical companies mixed amphetamine with a barbiturate sedative to try and counter the anxiety-inducing aspects of the amphetamine and prevent the drowsiness that came with barbiturates. Benzedrine inhalers, marketed to treat asthma, were available over the counter and soon became popular both as a medication and when people realised they could be cracked open and the amphetamine consumed via other methods. As mentioned, amphetamine is currently prescribed to treat ADHD. It might seem counterintuitive to give a stimulant to an individual with hyperactivity problems, but evidence suggests that amphetamine can increase the ability to concentrate, reduce instances of distraction, improve sustained attention, and reduce impulsive behaviours in populations with ADHD. Amphetamine has long been used as a medication for promoting weight loss due to the appetite-suppressive nature of the substance. It became a particular issue in the USA in the late 1960s, where a regimen combining amphetamines with other substances to counteract some of their side effects became known by the euphemistic term rainbow diet pills. It took deaths and an expose of how easy it was to get prescriptions for these pills published in Life magazine in the USA for a change in legislation, which happened in 1970. Even so, certain amphetamine or amphetamine-based substances are still prescribed for obesity today. What don't we know? As is often the case with illicit substances, a white powder or a pill could contain anything. Substances might not be what they are sold as and could be cut with all sorts of things. While researching this chapter, I found a number of references online that stated that speed referred to methamphetamine. These seemed, in most instances, to come from Australia, where data from police seizures and other sources indicate that even substances sold as amphetamine are in almost all cases powdered methamphetamine. Confusingly, in Australia certainly, and perhaps in other parts of the world, speed seems to refer to both amphetamine sulphate and methamphetamine. Given that methamphetamine is more easily absorbed than amphetamine, and that intoxication on meth lasts longer, this may be increasing the risk of harm, not to mention increasing the risk of confusion. It's worth pointing out that Australia has perhaps the most active researcher base investigating methamphetamine and amphetamine use across the world, as such, it's likely that monitoring evidence coming from Australia is more detailed, and it's also notable that methamphetamine use is more prevalent in Australia and Southeast Asia than in other parts of the world. When I spoke to researchers in Australia about this, they suggested that it may well be the case that methamphetamine is more widely used than amphetamine sulphate globally, and that speed is quite likely to be methamphetamine rather than amphetamine sulphate in other parts of the world too. One final thing. Amphetamine interacts dangerously with certain types of medication for depression and anxiety, specifically drugs known as MAOI inhibitors. It's extremely dangerous to take amphetamines if you are prescribed these. 
Chapter 3. Benzodiazepines, Valium, Xanax, Rohypnol and more. A few key facts. What is it? A synthesised powder or pill, many different individual varieties. A depressant, a minor tranquilizer, to be more precise. Valium and Xanax are widely prescribed in the UK and the USA for sleeping problems. Consumed by swallowing. The timescale varies, dependent on the type. Some effects are sedation of mind and muscle, impaired coordination and impaired ability to concentrate. The term benzodiazepine refers to a group of synthetic substances that have been used since the 1960s as a treatment for panic and anxiety. The first popular benzo was called Librium, but others that you may have heard of include diazepam, often known by the brand name Valium, Alprazolam, Xanax, and Rohypnol. There are numerous others as well, most of whose names end with LAM or PAM. Benzodiazepines may be appealing because they are relatively easy to get compared to some other illicit drugs. It's possible to get prescriptions for some benzos in various countries around the world, although in many places such prescriptions are limited to the short term, often no longer than four weeks at any time. Benzos might also be popular because they are a medication, so therefore could be perceived as safe compared to illicit substances made in bathtubs or DIY labs, although how true that is will be explored later. What are the short-term effects? Benzodiazepines are usually prescribed in a powder tablet or occasionally a gel capsule form. If the substances are purchased from other sources, they can sometimes be found as a powder. As such, they are usually swallowed, but sometimes snorted. Some people will use gel capsules to create a liquid and inject benzos, but this is an extremely dangerous method of consumption. Although all benzos have a broadly similar effect... Each compound has a slightly different profile. For example, Xanax has a faster onset and a shorter intoxication period than Valium. Benzos are known as minor tranquilizers in the medical profession. This means a medicine to reduce symptoms of anxiety, one that has a minor sedative effect rather than a major effect, such as that required for the treatment of more severe mental health conditions like schizophrenia. They work by inducing sedation to mind and muscle. Some people describe experiencing a cosy sleepiness or a calm chattiness on low doses. As expected, they can reduce feelings of anxiety as well as feelings of tension and stress. Their physical sedation effect means that they can also lower coordination abilities and impact on alertness and ability to concentrate. It's a very bad idea to drive or operate other heavy machinery when under the influence of benzodiazepines. At higher doses, people can start slurring their speech and experiencing more profound confusion. People are at increased risks of accidents because of the impact on coordination and concentration. The sedative effect could even lead to a loss of consciousness or experiences of amnesia or blackouts, similar to those experienced at a high level of alcohol consumption. Also similar to alcohol intoxication are the perhaps paradoxical reports of increased proneness to violence or aggressive behaviour from people intoxicated on benzos. While little is understood about why benzo intoxication might induce such behaviours, one theory is that benzodiazepines reduce inhibition, thus making a person more impulsive and likely to lash out where they would otherwise resist the urge to do so. If a person takes too high a dose and loses consciousness, they are at risk of choking on or inhaling their vomit. There is also a danger from the slowing and shallowing of breathing that benzodiazepines can produce, particularly in children or individuals with pre-existing lung or breathing problems. What are the longer-term effects? If a person has been using benzos for a while, they will build up a tolerance to them and require a larger dose to achieve the same effect. This is why, in the UK at least, prescriptions to benzodiazepines are broadly limited to two to four weeks at a time, rather than longer term. There's a risk of both a physical and psychological dependence to benzodiazepines after longer term and heavy use. People who have used benzos in this way report a severe impact on their daily life from being mildly sedated at all times. Similarly, regular users report that anxiety levels can increase after a while of regular use as well as feelings of panic and sleep problems. People also report decreased energy levels. 
There have been anecdotal reports of an increased risk of dementia or memory problems in long-term users of benzos. However, there's been little research into this, and at present it is unclear whether these effects could reverse after a person stops taking the substance. A person who has been regularly taking benzos can experience physical and psychological withdrawal when they stop taking them. Medical professionals advise seeking support if you want to quit benzos. Ideally, you will need to taper your dose down over a period of several months, or possibly up to a year, depending on the level of use. GPs that I spoke to also suggested that psychological support, such as cognitive behavioural therapy, can be helpful, as individuals initially prescribed the substance for treating their anxiety may find that symptoms increase when they stop taking them. Withdrawal symptoms also include an increased heart rate and blood pressure, the shakes, insomnia and sensitivity to light and sound. If a person tries to stop using benzodiazepines suddenly, they are at risk of more severe symptoms, such as seizures, which is why getting support is so strongly advised. Myths and misconceptions Benzos make highs from other drugs better. Benzodiazepines, when used recreationally rather than as prescribed, are very commonly used in conjunction with other drugs rather than by themselves, although this is not always the case. For example, survey data suggests that 30 to 50% of individuals with alcohol dependence also use benzos. People report that benzos can enhance the intoxication experience of other depressants such as alcohol or heroin. They can also reduce withdrawal effects from these substances. Indeed, benzodiazepines can sometimes be prescribed to help people going through alcohol withdrawal. Other people report using benzos to counter the effects of a stimulant that they have consumed. However, this sort of mixing can be really dangerous. Taking two depressants together, such as benzos and alcohol or heroin, can increase the risk of an overdose, of blacking out and therefore the risk of choking and of suffering ill effects from breathing being slowed. Conversely, mixing benzos with stimulants can mask the effects of both, meaning higher doses of both could be taken, putting extra strain on the heart and the liver and increasing the risk of overdose and of tolerance building up. There is also an increased likelihood of larger withdrawal effects, some of which could be potentially dangerous, as described earlier. So this is a myth. Valerian tea is natural Valium. Valerian is a herb that grows in Europe and Asia. The root has been used medicinally since ancient Greek and Roman times and it's still marketed today as a herbal medicine to treat conditions such as insomnia, anxiety and restless leg syndrome. However, there's no known active ingredient in valerian root and certainly not a benzodiazepine-like compound. Although, there's some inconclusive evidence that valerian root has an impact on a neurotransmitter called GABA, also implicated in the effects that benzos have. But is there any evidence to support valerian tea having an effect on insomnia or anxiety? To date, there has been very little good quality research conducted, and the evidence is pretty weak. A systematic review of the literature on the link between valerian root and anxiety found only one study that had investigated this to a high standard, with only 36 participants. This study found no evidence that the effect of valerian was any different to a placebo and weak evidence that diazepam, also tested, reduced anxiety symptoms to a greater degree than valerian root did. Similarly, a review investigating herbal medicine and insomnia found no evidence that valerian root is effective to treat this either. So it's a myth. Grapefruit juice can increase the high. There's some evidence that grapefruit juice interacts with a number of different medications. And included on that list are certain benzodiazepines, including diazepam, midazolam and triazolam. Grapefruit juice can result in slower metabolism of these substances, leading to a build-up of them in the blood. But rather than increasing the high, this is more likely to increase the risk of unwanted side effects, such as passing out or loss of coordination. Other medications can also interact with benzodiazepines in this way, including antihistamines and some other medications that treat depression. So this is partly true. Do benzos have medical uses? Benzodiazepines were initially discovered in the mid-1950s and were investigated as a potential medication to treat anxiety after animal studies found that Librium, the first to be synthesised, made mice relaxed and drowsy. At the time, barbiturates were used to treat anxiety, but these had a high risk of negatively impacting on a person's ability to breathe properly. Librium, and then a few years later Valium, immediately became extremely popular particularly in the USA. 
By the 1970s, they were topping most prescribed medication lists, but by the 1980s, it was becoming more obvious that there were risks of dependence from long-term prescriptions. While these risks are still very real, benzodiazepines are still prescribed across the world today, most commonly as a short-term treatment for conditions such as panic disorder, generalised anxiety disorder or insomnia. Benzodiazepines can also be used in conditions where people have seizures, as the sedation effect of the compound can quell these. For example, people with epilepsy who have prolonged seizures and people experiencing alcohol withdrawal, where it can ease agitation and trembles that can occur. Benzos are sometimes prescribed for pre-surgery anxiety and can also be used in a medical setting to reduce panic in individuals having a bad reaction to intoxication on a hallucinogen. What don't we know? There's some evidence that there might be a risk to the foetus if benzos are used during pregnancy. There is a small increase in the risk of the baby being born with a cleft palate, although the overall risk is low and the evidence to date suggesting a causal link is not strong. Most of this research has been conducted on individuals who were prescribed benzodiazepines during pregnancy and who were therefore were likely to be experiencing conditions such as anxiety or epilepsy, which could also increase the risk of complications during pregnancy. Similarly, many of the women in these studies were taking other medication as well, so pinpointing the effect of benzodiazepines specifically is challenging. There are anecdotal reports of babies being born with what is referred to as floppy infant syndrome if benzos are used very close to birth. Symptoms of this can include poor muscle tone in the infant, sedation, impaired metabolic responses to experiencing coldness, or reluctance to suckle. These symptoms have been found to last somewhere between a few hours up to some months after the baby was born. However, there is little evidence that these symptoms are associated with longer-term problems in the child, and whether the use of benzodiazepines during pregnancy is a significant risk that outweighs the potential benefits they might have is not clear. Outside of benzodiazepine prescription, Problematic patterns of benzo use have been found in survey studies to be linked to socioeconomic factors, such as being in receipt of government benefits, being homeless and having previously been incarcerated. This is quite a complicated finding to unpick. Is it that people with these backgrounds or experiences are more likely to be drawn to using benzodiazepines? Or does regular consumption of a sedating substance like benzos make holding down a job harder or maintaining social networks more of a challenge? In all likelihood, it is a complex relationship operating in both directions, and it's also important to remember that most people using benzodiazepines will also use other substances, particularly alcohol and heroin, and that the use of benzos along with these substances often predicts more problematic and dangerous use and poorer outcomes than using those substances without using benzos as well. The majority of people who use benzones but do not use other substances tend to do so after initially being prescribed them, perhaps highlighting how difficult it is to stop using benzos once you've started. When I was growing up, the benzodiazepine that I had heard of because of many media reports was temazepam. Data collected in 1987 suggested that it was the prescription drug most commonly used illicitly across the UK. It was particularly used among people who injected drugs, according to a study in 1994, and was implicated in a rise in drug-related deaths in the early 1990s in Scotland. Because of these harms, and perhaps the media attention too, temazepam is no longer available on the NHS, and if pharmacies stock it for private prescriptions, they have to follow strict restrictions, for instance storing it in safe custody on their premises. Prescriptions have to go through special controlled drug prescription form. Why was temazepam so problematic during this period? It's possibly because of its profile compared to other benzodiazepines, such as speed of onset and duration of effect. But it may also be more prosaically due to availability. Temazepam was around, so it was used. Also, it was possible to get temazepam as a gel, meaning it could be injected. Since the change in legislation, it is only available as a solid tablet, minimising this possibility. Today, Xanax, the brand name, the substance is Alprazolam, is getting a lot of media attention in the UK. Xanax is a prescription medication, although not available on the NHS, so not, or certainly only very rarely, prescribed in the UK. But illicit Xanax may have been made outside of a pharmaceutical company. 
If this is the case, then the quality and dosage contained within any one tablet is immediately less easy to predict. It's unlikely that people making their own Xanax will be able to make it to the same standard as a pharmaceutical company, even if they wanted to. And that's assuming it really is Xanax in the first place. If a person buys an illicit substance over the internet, there's no guarantee that they will receive what they ordered. Headlines in the UK have claimed that young people are buying fake Xanax over the internet and experiencing severe negative consequences, including overdose and death. There have been cases where the Xanax was actually nothing of the sort, sometimes instead containing opioids or other psychoactive substances. In Wales, there is a postal-based service that will test samples of drugs mailed to it, called Wedinos. In their 2017-2018 annual report, they detailed having received an increase in benzodiazepines being submitted to the service, behind more commonly sent substances like cocaine and MDMA. However, they also found that a large proportion of the benzodiazepine samples submitted to them in reality contained either a different benzo to the one the sender believed was present, or a different substance entirely. Some samples submitted as Xanax were actually caffeine tablets, for example. Taking a substance without knowing what is in it can greatly increase the risk of harm.